Hi guys. Now, uh, the, the past couple of shows have been very popular because I, I think a lot of people have uh, mental issues in our in our business. Probably you and I both included, which is what makes oh, yeah. it so relevant. Which makes it so relevant because, like, you know, I don't think we're, you know, portraying ourselves as being uh, anything uh, other than just as damaged as everyone else in our bodybuilding industry. Oh, a hundred percent. In fact, the best therapists are ones that are the most damaged. <laughs> you know, when I did <laughs> I did a rotation when I was in medical school in the. Um, a psychiatry and every uh psychiatrist there it was a locked unit it was like a, a, you know there was some really crazy people in that unit mm -hmm. and every therapist there told me that they had their own therapist <laughs> you have to <laughs> but i would leave it and I, I thought i was going crazy and they're like that's normal you you it's transference yeah. you know for sure anyway all right today's topic is going to be about um people or bodybuilders specifically who are afraid to come off of uh their cycles of whether it be anabolic steroids, G growth hormone, peptides, whatever, SARMs, whatever the hell, whatever they're taking, a lot of people have trouble coming off and uh, they don't want to do off periods anymore. People are, nowadays, I hate these terms, but I'm going to say it anyway, cruising and bridging and basically making up excuses never to go off their drugs mm -hmm. with for the fear of the fact that they're going to get smaller or they're not going to have a good sex drive and they're not going to. There's a million, I hear a million and one, you know, excuses. Um, when someone comes to you with a problem like this, Leslie, what, I mean, what, what advice do you give them to get out of that mindset that, hey, um, I can't go off because I'm going to ruin my physique or I'm, I'm not going to be a good bodybuilder? Because obviously there are people that go off and, and it doesn't happen to them. But yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of these people, especially the, the new generation, are afraid to do that. In order to change any behavior, Dave, I look at, you know, I explore with someone, what is the, the payoff? If you're going to continue a behavior, there has to be a payoff. Now, the payoff may not be healthy, but I want to look at what it gives them. So for a lot of, let's, I'm going to focus on bodybuilders, it's that perception that they're not big enough. Now, I do, um, I'm going to go a little bit more into detail about what's considered acceptable and what's not acceptable when it comes to bodybuilders and, and thinking that they're not big enough. But when I have a bodybuilder come to me, with that it's to saying okay you know is it you know what is it for you that you get from this now for a lot of them let's say if they want to stay on peds it's because they want to continue to train they want to get bigger it help peds help with let's say um muscle recovery and also with that if the faster the muscle recovers the more you can hit it harder and get bigger so i mean from that perspective you know it helps them get to their goal now keep in mind a lot of people who use or the issues with um people who are having troubles with that perception are actually not necessarily bodybuilders. There's a lot of people who use PDs who are not bodybuilders or athletes, and they just want to look good and feel good. Now, assuming that they've done their homework and they're not doing crazy dosages just to try to get off, they're like, okay, there's that fear of if I get off these PEDs, I'm going to look back. I'm going to look like the way I did beforehand. And I didn't like that look. So they do that comparison thing. Yeah. But you so know, I, about, think, I think that we should differentiate because you're right. There are people who do HRT or they do like a mm -hmm. 200 milligram dose of testosterone, which is like a replacement dose because they do, they feel better, they recover right. better, you know, and, and it's just, it's a well being thing. They're really not interested in competing and putting on massive amounts of muscle. I separate those people in a different category because that's a, that's a physiological dose to take. I'm talking right. about people taking pharmacological dosages to get benefits because we know that if you, if you just always stay on, you stop making improvements in your physique after a while. So they almost know that they're, they're, what they're doing is not necessarily the right thing, but they, but they, yet they can't come off. You know, they'll go from, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand milligrams of gear per week, and then they drop it down to the two hundred milligram TRT dose, even though they're twenty, you know, three years old, and mm -hmm. you know, they, there's no reason why they, they should not come off the, uh, you know, the, the cycle completely. But, you know, to your point, Dave, it's in their minds. They have it fixated. I have to take this. So, and, in, in, you know, again, it's the, that payoff. Is it because it makes them feel good and, and feel good, uh, better about themselves and they're monitoring their, their, you know, obviously they're getting blood work to stay healthy. But is it also because they want to get likes on social media? I mean, this, with social media, people are putting, I mean, apart from filters and all that other stuff. Yeah. 
but you know, they want to look good or, you know, when there's a show and they go to the show and they're not participating in the show, they're just attending the show. A lot of people will take gear because who's going to be there. They're going to see their friends. They're going to see fellow competitors. They might see judges. They want to have a certain look. Right. But that's why you're supposed to go do your off cycle, you know, December, you know, November, December, January. So that when you, there are no shows really, you know, you're going right. to that point. And so you can kind of like hide out. And, you know, in the winter, most people wear big clothes anyway. No one's wearing, you know, tank tops, except for me when I was <laughs> in the middle but, of you the know winter. What? But Dave, it's also that fear that even if they go off for three months, two or three months, oh my gosh, they're going to lose all their gains. Yeah, that's not how it works. Not, it's not, it's not, it, we know that's not the case, you know, so they're, yeah. they're, it's obviously a delusional mindset. And I think, I think there's, there are people that I talk to who really want to, they want to come off, but they're so scared mm -hmm. and yeah. they've been convinced by people who talk about these bridging and, you know, all these other crazy things. Look, they, I have a lot of people watch my videos, right? And, and they know that I say, and, I, and, and it makes sense, that if you don't go off completely, your receptors never, and I'm not talking about toxicity, because you can stay on right, a right. and you're, you're going to probably still detox. It's, it's a receptor sensitivity issue. And when you're always on, a farm, on, a, on an exogenous dose of something, your receptors never resensitize themselves. So then when you go back on, on, on cycle, I'm not going to stuff. When you go back on cycle, you you don't get the same response because your receptors aren't as good. If you clean out completely, what happens is your body senses a, a, a lack of, of testosterone, right? So it gets, it gets worried. So it produces a lot more androgen receptors, hoping that it's going to respond to something that, that the body doesn't know is not there, but it thinks it's there. So if you yeah. do this for six to eight weeks and then you go back on a cycle, you're going to respond so much better. So these people don't even realize that they're actually sacrificing their gains so it goes back to the old, you know, adage we always say that people sometimes do things to the detriment of, of themselves because they're they have such a, a great fear of what they're doing. So they're fearful, but at least they're on drugs and they feel good about that. Right. Uh, they're more fearful of not knowing what's going to happen when they go off the drugs, even though they conceptually know that it's going to improve their physique long term. Right. I mean, there's that, you know, there's the you know, there's constant battles between the heart and then the mind. So if our heart says, you know, we want to be bigger. And our minds like, you know, saying, well, to get bigger, you have to come off this for a little bit, like you said, to reset. A lot of the core of this is, and you hit the nail on the head, is fear. This is a type of anxiety disorder. With any type of anxiety disorder, there is a protocol. I mean, I use uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as far as how to deal with anxiety. And it's going down to the root of the issue. When did this first begin for you? You know, when you started. Now, for some people, it's like I didn't start taking PDs until I started bodybuilding. Okay. Right. What did that give you? What kind of, I mean, it's a different type of high, but it's a high from, let's say, the praise from other people. It's the high of looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, hey, I look better, or being able to lift heavier and you're beating your 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 maximum lifts. You know, it's what is the the payoff for you? And, and let's talk about other alternatives to get a different type of payoff because to keep on the same trajectory and saying, I want the same results being off PEDs not sure that's really a realistic expectation, right. but being able to reset, you know, think about a marathon runner, they can run, they can hit their, you know, at the end of the end of the line, are they going to be prepared to do another race? Not right away. They no. need adequate rest and then they can hit the, the race, uh, the race again. I always, I've told the story before as a runner, I used to, you know, the week of a race are, cross country coach would start tapering our training down. Like, right. like instead of yeah. running for 10 miles a day or eight miles a day, we were running you know, six and then four and then three down to like the day before the, the race, we wouldn't, we would just jog like maybe two miles or something like that just to, you know, keep the blood flowing. And I would go after practice and run another six miles because I felt like I was <laughs> like, you know, this, I'm, I, how am I going to run such a good race? If I'm not running, if I'm stopping, like in my freaking warp, you know, 19 year old head, 18 year old head, I felt like if I wasn't going to run 10 miles every day, then I wasn't going to run a good race, not even realizing that I was wearing my body down, that I'm not going to lose endurance in three days. And if, in fact, I'm going to actually feel better because my body's going to heal up. But I couldn't understand that mentality because I was too emotionally immature and, and just maybe immature in general. And so I was actually sacrificing how good I ran on the weekends at the races. And I didn't even realize it. And I think that that's where people are at now. They think, well, more, 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 more. And if they don't understand that sometimes you got to take a couple steps back to take a huge giant leap forward. 
you know, in, yeah, apart from resting your, your body and your receptors, it's also your mind. Because sometimes like, you know, even if it's like, even I have a hard time doing this because I like to train. So for me, you know, when I used to have my coaches that say, you know, take a week off, I'd look at them like they grew a third eye. I'm like, what do you mean take a week off? I'm not going to take a week off. <laughs> you know? Deload, what the heck is a deload? I'm not going to deload. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, it is a, a bit of a mind thing where you have to kind of say, okay, reset. And it oftentimes takes someone else to help you. Okay, be accountable to someone. Because a lot of times we don't have the willpower to do it on ourselves. We have to have someone say, no, this is what you're doing this week. Follow the plan. And unless someone told me, a coach told me to do that, I wasn't going to deload. I wasn't going to take a week off this trip. <laughs> I had a girl uh, who, who had came to me and she was on um, Cytomel T3 for five years straight. And she was so, I'm like, and she wanted me to do a contest diet. I said, contest diet? I said, what am I going to do? You're on, you've been taking Cytomel you know, for, for five years, I said, I got to get you off of that first. She's like, yeah, I'm so worried. I'm going to get fat. And you know what? I tapered her off it and I had her on a good diet and she was accountable to me and she didn't gain one. Matter of fact, she got leaner, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things I noticed, I hated, you know, the idea of going off when I was in the middle of my, you know, being the biggest guy, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. But when, once I got past that first week where I didn't take a shot, number one, it felt great that I didn't have to take a shot every couple of every other day. Number two, <laughs> It became a mental challenge now for me. I wanted to see how long I can go. How much can I endure? Can I eat right? Can I train right? You know, how long can I go before I actually don't feel good because I'm off gear? And believe it or not, you know, I would go about, you know, once, I didn't start feeling like a little low energy until about eight weeks, you know, into it. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. about the time, you know, I was almost ready to go back on at that point. So it was only like a week that I kind of felt a little low. And that's because I maximized my food. I made sure I took my right supplements. I trained. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't try to set records in the gym in terms of weights because I knew that I wasn't going to be as strong, but I did train still. I mean, instead of squatting 600 pounds, I was squatting, you know, 500 pounds or 450 or something like that. Who mm -hmm. cares? It still felt just as heavy because yeah. my strength wasn't as good, but I felt good. I looked good. You know, I lost a lot of fluid that you retain from taking a, going on a cycle and all the other drugs you're taking. So in essence, it was a challenge for me and I knew it was a limited time I was going to be doing it. So I just looked at it as like almost like a little mini contest diet. Okay. I can eat what I want, but I just can't take the drugs I want. Let me see how good I can look on it. And I think if people looked at it from that perspective, as opposed to, Oh my God, every, I think the people have create mental symptoms before there's even a single physical symptom from coming off. I mean, and I, and I credit social media for a big piece of that. I'm not saying it's the only piece, but since the onslaught of social media and people comparing themselves to other people and, the, you know, all the, the internet trolls and their feedback, or I call them, uh, you know, armchair uh, quarterbacks, you know, <laughs> they have these comments from their chair and it's like, you know, have you ever even competed? Before? I call them so, computer bodybuilders. That's my uh, computer thing. bodybuilders. Okay. If Don, Don, the Ripper Ross was Don, Don, the Ripper Ross was this like larger than life character. He was in wrestling. He was a bodybuilder. He wrote for the muscular development for years and he, he, he loved to call people like who like pretended to be bodybuilders, like pencil necks, these fucking <laughs> pencil necks. He'd be like pencil neck bodybuilders. He would be calling these guys, computer bodybuilders, these computer bodybuilders guys, they're not real. You know, why are you listening to these motherfuckers? You know, that that's the kind of personality. <laughs> and, it, and if you think about it, it is kind of stupid. You see these guys, they have no, they have marginal physiques. They're giving mm -hmm. advice on drugs and they're giving advice on, you know, and everything and anything and people because they have a big social media following are listening to these people right. as if they know what they're talking about because they read a couple of online articles on pubmed you know what i mean guys there's a practical application in addition to an academic you know um application and so if someone online is telling you what you want to hear maybe that's not what you should be listening to because you know leslie what happens is these guys know they have to come off and then they go and watch some Instagram video or TikTok video that says the best way to go off is to bridge. You just, instead of, you're not going to take drugs, you're just going to take Anivar or you're just going to take SARMs or you're just going to take, you know, the, a little GA. And before they know it, people are like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Of course, because they don't really want to go off these people. And now they got people who are validating their right. insecurity of not wanting to go off. And so, of course, they're going to follow that. Why wouldn't they? I mean, that's human nature, right? You have to tune those fucking people out. They don't, you stick to your coach or you stick to someone who, who gives valid information, someone who's actually done it. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. me. 
there are other people who have done it, you know, from the, the top guys in the sport, Dennis James and, and Fuad Abiyad and all these other guys out there who have done it. They can give you the right advice because they've successfully done it and they have the knowledge. So I, I, I just don't understand why people, you know, do that. But I, you're right. It is social media. They're, they're brainwashed by it, essentially. And you also have to be careful, Dave, on what you read, even from reputable sources, because the application, if you have a definition, the definition, you might say, OK, I fit this, these criteria, but does that necessarily mean I'm, I'm that, that definition? So I'm going to give you an example, Dave. And if you'll be my guinea pig, sure. I'm going to have you kind of think about the answer to this question and say yes or no to it. And in fact, if anyone is, want, uh, any of the audience members, you guys can play around, along and let me know in the comments below, does, does any of this criteria fit for you? So according to... <laughs> The definition of okay, so bigorexia. It's basically what that is. A, it's a no, form ask, of. Is that a real ac academic term now? No, no. Okay. What is it? What do no. they call it? It's actually muscle dysmorphia. So okay. basically, if you think about the umbrella term, that's the body dysmorphia disorder. So it's basically this perceived limitation of your body. Now, in the context of the official definition, that does not relate to body fat or body weight. An offshoot is the muscle dysmorphia that has to do with your body composition. So people are always um, asking me, well, if I'm a bodybuilder, does that, does that mean I have body dysmorphia because, you know, I have, you know, a lot of perceived inadequacies, I have weaknesses in this body part and this body part or whatever, because it's hard to have that complete, uh, complete package. So I'm going to address that in just a second, but I want to know, according to this, if you have uh, the bigorexia. Let's see. All right, go ahead. So one, overexerting yourself at the gym. Has that ever happened? Always, always, yeah. Okay. Working out compulsively. Abs back in the day, absolutely, yes. Okay. Use of steroids. Ab yes. <laughs> I, got, I got three three out of three so far. <laughs> Excessively looking at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, I got to check that box too, yeah. <laughs> I love this one. Abuse of supplements and constantly drinking protein shakes. Yeah, back in the day, that was me for sure. Not not anymore, maybe, but I don't right, know if I checked right. that box now. But I definitely <laughs> checked it, you know, 15 years ago. Irritability and angry outbursts. Um, not in general, but yeah, if I didn't eat, if I was hungry right. and irritable, or if I thought I was missing a meal because someone was wasting my time doing it. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. Panicking if a gym session is missed. <laughs> you know, I hate to admit that, but yeah, I did. I, if, if it ruined my schedule, you know, yeah, I don't know if this happened to you ever, Leslie, but back in the day, you know, I was always like, I'm Mr. Late, you know. I would get to the gym, you know, I would, like, but there would be like 30 minutes left before the gym closed. I'm like, all right, I can get my workout in, I can get my workout in. And then for some reason, like some, some guy had, a, they wanted to close the gym 10 minutes early and it was, oh. up work. and I would be like, I'm like, you're not closing this gym early. And, you know, and a lot of times I was so big back in the day, they were like, oh, you can stay Dave because we got to clean up anyway. But you know, we want to get home. It's like, it's Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, that's cool. I'll, I'll stay while you clean it up. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I checked the box. <laughs> Another one is forcing yourself to work out even if you're injured. Sometimes I, I think I was better about it, but yeah, I, if, I would always test the limits. Yeah, if I wasn't like like in, in severe agony, I would go to the gym if I was injured. Yeah. And did you ever prioritize working out over family or social life? Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I I can say I said yes to all of these. Yeah, all yeah, of these. I, I guess I must have. It. <laughs> and I might. How many do you have to get checked to actually still to, to have it? Like seven? Well, you see, that's the thing. It's like the majority of them. Okay. There's not a, because it's not an official diagnosis. Right. It's not eight out of 10, I got you. Okay. but this is, these are some of the symptoms. And this is why I'm saying you have to be careful because, you know, I don't think we're the only two and maybe yeah. we are, but again, comment below. But I mean, I think a lot of people can fit into this category, but you have to be careful when you look at a description and put it into context. Right. So, you know, when you look at over exerting yourself at the gym, have you ever, I know I have, do I do it all the time? No, I don't. In fact, I try really hard not to. Um, 
but do I do it, especially when I'm in prep, especially in those final weeks? Absolutely, because I'm pushing you know myself. What, Leslie, you could, if you could, you could apply that to almost every sport, right? I mean, yes. If you apply that to basketball, then these people would have basketball anorexia or something. Like yeah. That. You know, I mean, if you apply it to people playing video games, they would have video game mania. You know, you apply it to people who are studying, you know, to be, you know, brain surgeons. I mean, they're going to have that. You have to be. You have to be in, indulgent in, in whatever you're doing to be the best at what you're doing. Now, the question is, if you're not competing and you're still doing that, that might be considered. I think that's really a better you know, assessment of whether you have it or not. Right. Yeah. But um, one other component, I mean, certainly, yes, if you're having these kind of things and you're not an athlete and you don't have to be the best of the best, right. you know, and you're, you're pushing yourself to some degree, you know, to a higher level, then yes, then that becomes a little bit more clear cut how I want to differentiate between bodybuilders who have muscle dysmorphia and those who do not has to do with, now I'll use myself as an example. Okay. One of my flaws is my legs are too small. <laughs> so I have to work on building my legs, which I'm still right. trying to do. It's been like two decades, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> now for me, because that's something when I compete, that's you know, part, you know one of the things I know I have to work on you know, me focusing on that is one thing and, and trying to and, and looking myself in the mirror sometimes, not very much, to be honest, because I hate looking in the mirror. But, you know, I'll be more, you know, if I had, let me put it this way, if I had muscle dysmorphia, when I go into the gym, I'd be like checking out wearing my shorts. I'd be checking out my legs all the time. I'd be taking pictures. I'd be asking people, how do my legs look? And then I lost them 10 minutes later. How do my legs go? I just did leg press. What do they look now? Do they look bigger? Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's really, it's really compulsive. They're, they're um, and obsessive as far as their thoughts and their behaviors. It's not just, oh, I need to grow my legs. It's, you know, it's that repetitive behavior of constantly checking myself, checking with other people. How do I look? Doing pictures every 10 minutes. Like that, that's too much. It's one thing to say progress pictures, that's fine. But, you know, but it's another to take it to that degree. And that is what dis makes it distinct from the typical bodybuilder versus a bodybuilder with dysmorphia. Thank God there were no selfies that could be taken back in my day. There was not even a cell phone back then that could do that. So, <laughs> we, but, you know, I, I wasn't obsessively, maybe I would have taken more pictures of myself. Who the heck knows, you know? but, well, it's so, funny. So what, what, what tools can you give people to help get them out of that, that obsessive compulsiveness so that they're can still be, you know, dedicated to what they do, but maybe not, you know, a slave to it in a sense. So usually when people, especially an athlete, when I work with an athlete that has these kind of, you know, obsessive compulsive behaviors and thoughts, what I usually do is I say to them, okay, I want you to record how many times you do this in a day. So we have an accurate number. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, okay, I want you to take it down. I want you to take it down so you do like three less times that you do that. So it's a gradual reduction where they still get to check, but they're reducing it to the point where it might be only once a day. Right. Right. And then I would say, and, and if they're trouble, having trouble getting there, I make it a, a competition for them. Mm -hmm. And because people, you know, any type of athlete likes competition. Sure. So I dare them and I, and I put something into place to saying, Hey, if you can do this, this is the reward. Or I'll say, right. hey, what do you want your reward to be? Right, right. That's what I do did for, for coming off, you know, cycles and stuff like that. I would almost see, it was like I made a competition. Can I, how long can I stay off, you know, and prove yeah. to myself that I can do this? And it was, it almost like was a challenge for me. Hey, how good can I look in, you know, eight, at the end of eight weeks, not being on a cycle, right? And to say, because how much better would it, what kind of message would it send to you if you were able to be off cycle and still hit the same weight load. Right. To say, oh, what, you know what? Really similar. You know, I, a lot yeah. of uh, commercials that I did and a lot of appearances uh, and even some guest posings and some photo shoots I did were off season where I was mm -hmm. off for like six or eight weeks. And the reason I got these jobs was because no one else would do it because people looked terrible because a lot of people, when they went off drugs, they, they wouldn't train. They didn't eat right. They That's the swap. key. Yeah. And you know what? I was the opposite. I was like, I was working harder to, to try to keep myself looking right. I was making sure I was getting all my meals. I was going to the gym. I was sleeping more because I knew that my body had a tougher time recovering. And 
I get phone calls and they'd be like, uh, are you, how do you look? You know, we want to do a photo shoot for some body part, some body part photo shoots we'll pay you for, or there's a commercial audition. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't think I look good, but everyone else thinks I look good. So I would go and they would be like, you're enormous. I remember I was, we, they had a, an Emmy award show uh, with the, the writers of the David Letterman show won the best Emmy and they wanted to film each bodybuilder as one of the writers like they would announce the writer's name and they would show a bodybuild okay. and i looked the best pretty much there, even though i wasn't the best victor martinez was probably a better bodybuilder than me but you know he wasn't in shape in his off season and they used me as david letterman which was great because i got the you know and they announced this on the emmy awards you know so and it it just goes to show that if you if you stay in shape and you and you work just as hard at a strategy to look your best while you're off sometimes sometimes it, it leads to you know to opportunities that you would never have imagined before and it also puts you in a healthier mindset because and i was and i did this too you know you know i i can't you know <laughs> i learned this the hard way yeah. off season i went a little bit too crazy off season i never missed a workout it was the eating and uh, keeping the eating in check in your off season is so key <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, but you know what, Leslie, a lot of bodybuilders don't eat enough in the off season because what they do is they don't train as hard because they think, well, why should I train hard? Because I'm not going to be able to grow anyway, because I'm not mm -hmm. on drugs. And then when you don't train hard, you tend to miss meals. And then when you miss meals, that's when you start losing muscle. So a lot of people's muscle losses when they're off cycle is not necessarily due to the fact that they're not on a huge cycle of drugs. It's because they're just not focused as, as, as intently as they were when they were on drugs. In other words, they're missing workouts, they're missing meals. They're not taking their nutritional supplements every day. They're not getting enough sleep. Maybe they're going out with their friends a little more, you know? And so you really have no one to blame, but yourself when you go off and you lose size. Okay. Because you shouldn't lose that much in eight weeks because the first four weeks you're off. Most of the time you're on a PCT of, you know, HCG or Clomid. And you still have drugs in your system from the cycle. Mm. So you're really, if you're going off for eight weeks, you're really only off for four weeks. And there's no excuse. Four weeks is like the snap, the blink of your eye. There's no way you should lose that much muscle in four weeks. So I think people do it to themselves is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I, and I help people in their off season as a mental game coach, because you, it, it's, it doesn't mean it's a time to relax. In certain ways, you don't have to worry about uh, certain things as being as rigid for sure, right. but the other main components have to still be there. There needs Structure. to be that accountability, still train hard. And to your point, just saying, okay, well, when people are in prep, of course, they're going to be training hard, but what about in their off season? So what's going to light a fire under their butt to basically be able to do that? So I look at people and to say, what's preventing you from doing that, you know, and helping them do strategies because it's going to be tailored different for different people because different people get um, motivated and I, I'm not talking about motivational quotes or, or podcasts, which are, are really good, but I'm, I'm talking about internal. There has to be some a fire that you can light inside yourself mm -hmm. to get yourself to push it. So I'm not competing until October. When I get the gym, I'm competing like I'm competing in a few weeks. Look, so that, it's, that's, it's that's the smart thing to do. I mean, look, at yeah, Rammy. you have to. Rammy didn't train for 12, six or something like I think Chad Nichols said like eight months after the Olympia and 10 months. After I remember the seeing that. Yeah. I mean, how, how could you do that? If you're Mr. Olympia, I don't care if you're, if you're doing pushups in your, in your house, you know, some people, and he's a genetic freak. He can get away with it. But for most people, you can't do that. And so people see Ravi didn't train, Lebroni didn't train in the off season. This one didn't train. And then in six weeks, they were back to what they were. Yeah. They mm -hmm. got back to what they were, but they never made improvements because of that. And so you have to have a mindset, like you said, even though you're off cycle, you're really not off your program. You're still on the program. There's, it's just structured a little differently now because there's a different strategy. It's about maintenance, not necessarily yeah. putting on size. But if you ignore that period, that eight weeks, you can set yourself back pretty far if you just kind of neglect the fact that you're still living a bodybuilding lifestyle. I mean, yeah, it, physically, when you want to put on more muscle in your off season, that's great. But the thing is, what are you doing to build up your mind? If you don't build your mind up in your in your off season, how the heck are you going to be able to perform to your peak capacity when you're in your in, in prep, when you have all these other variables? Yeah. You got to start with the basics and start getting your groundwork in now in your off season. And work on your business, too, when you're when you're off cycle. Mm -hmm. so you're, maybe you're not as intense into the training 
and, and into the eating because you you know you're on you are off cycle and it's, you're kind of taking a little mental break. But use your brain for something else now. Maybe start building a, a supplement brand or building an online coaching you know you know business or or anything something that that's related to something that you enjoy doing. You might be you might paint body bowls. I don't know what you do for a living, you know, and you, and you might start painting you know doing portraits mm -hmm. for people. Whatever your 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 passion is uh, aside from bodybuilding or even related to bodybuilding, find something else that you can do. Uh, business wise or just even hobby wise to keep your mind, you know, you know, thinking and, and being creative. And I think that what that break does give you is it gives you a, a, a freshness when you start up again, like, oh, I feel good now. I feel like I, I did when I first started working out. I, now I can go full all out in full force. And, and if you don't break that cycle every year and you kind of continuously, you get what happens is you get stagnant. And your body gets stagnant. It doesn't look. It doesn't make improvements, and you're just kind of looking the same all the time. And judges want to see changes in your physique. It's yep. very important that they see a noticeable difference from year to year. Otherwise, you're going to go down rather than up. And I think that the only way to do that is to is to make changes, drastic changes. And that's what going off does. It shocks your body, and your body starts to have to you know do things for itself, so to speak, not relying on the exogenous drugs. And then when you do go back on the exogenous drugs, now your body responds again, and then you get you get another great burst of growth and and and, and change in your physique. So, you know, not, give me three tools before we close up today, today's show that people can use to number one help them deal with an off period of coming off, and number two deal with maybe some obsessive compulsive you know issues they might have related to the fact that maybe they don't think they're big enough, the bigger X series. Also, the, the accountability piece, make mm -hmm. sure you're not accountable just to, you know, on your own because you're not going to get the results. Because if you did get we're having results, we wouldn't be having this conversation or you wouldn't be struggling with what you've got. Right. So have someone outside that knows what they're talking about that can guide you to help you keep you accountable and give you strategies on how to deal with those. Again, there's a payoff. What does that pay off for you and what might be unhealthy about it? Not everything about the payoff is, is unhealthy. But there's going to be something deep down that is unhealthy and we need to look at that and a lot of times it's also being able to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. when you're going into the gym if you're doing leg day and you're comfortable there's a problem with that <laughs> so, you know and you got to do that with your mind too it's kind of like if you want to go off pds or if you're trying to go off pds and you're struggling with that you got to be uncomfortable and be willing to go to a place you've never been and in order to have that fear partly you know being accountable and having strategies it's basically, you know, fighting that fear. Mm -hmm. And, and, and no, not everyone knows what that fear is for them. They're just like, well, I'm just kind of afraid I'm going to lose my size. Well, there's usually something behind that. Have you dug down deep to find out what that is? And if it's, you know, because if you're having troubles getting off of it, it's one thing to say, I don't want to come off of it. And they're okay with that. And I'm not talking about psychologically, they're having an issue with it. But if you are saying, hey, you know, I'm, I've wanted to come off it, but I'm really afraid to doing it. There's a lot of cognitive behavioral strategies that can help you do that. So I was talking about um, something called graded exposure. So basically reducing the number of times you would, you know, let's say check yourself in the mirror or, you know, ask for feedback is to saying, how can I get that feedback another way to say, you know what, let me be, do you know what constructive feedback is? Negative feedback is criticism. Constructive feedback is saying something good. So how about balancing something to saying, okay, like for me, my legs, they're small, but you know what? I see a line over here. I'm going to really work on that line. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah. turning it around and saying, Hey, without that PD, can I get that line without the PD? Let me like, let me challenge myself. So I want you guys to really think about challenging yourselves mentally on your fears. And if you need help, get that accountability. Right. No, you're right. But you know what? I always, you know, I always also tell people, look at the biggest guys in our industry, and, and these big, the biggest guys tend to take off. Ronnie mm. told me to take off periods. Kai took off periods. Um, you know, Dorian after Mr. Olympia took off periods. You got to give you, your your brain and your body a chance to rest, and and your receptors a chance to recover. Even I did. I mean, you, people could say what they want. You know, I was one of the biggest guys out there, obviously, and and I had a strategy. Every year I came off. You know, and mm. uh, whether I wanted to do it or not, because. I knew that that was going to help me get bigger and better the following year. And so yeah. use the fact that there are people out there that have done it successfully and do have great physiques. Um, and I guarantee if you talk to some of the top, top guys in the Olympia, 
a lot of these guys do go completely off. And, you know, uh, I'm sure there's guys that don't, don't get me wrong, but there are plenty of guys that are super impressive that do. And that should be encouraging enough for you guys watching this to know if these guys can do it, I can do it as well. Mm-hmm. All right, Leslie, uh, final words before we wrap today up. Yeah, I want you guys to post your comments below because I've been, I'm just starting to do a YouTube video that kind of piggybacks on this session. So I did one um, after Xavier. So I did the full, because last, uh, last episode, I think I only did like two questions out of the seven. So I did a YouTube video on all seven if you guys oh, want to watch it. Awesome. That's awesome. But if and you where, guys. Where is that video up? Well, if you do YouTube and just put Leslie Timble, um, okay. it should come up. If you're having issues finding it, just let me know. But if you guys can also post below any kind of questions, you know, I can add in, in my next YouTube video about muscle dysmorphia or body dysmorphia or big orexia or PEDs, you know, certainly, um, certainly post them below and I can put them in my, my next YouTube video. And if anyone has any uh, suggestions for future episodes of Iron Therapy, please post them in the comments below mm-hmm. and we will uh, absolutely address all of them, especially if they're valid. And so, I want to thank uh, Leslie once again for coming on today and uh, helping us be a little less maybe heavy in the head today. You know, every time I talk to you, even though it's not necessarily a show related to me, I, I, I feel like I had a session where I actually feel my brain feels almost uh, unburdened of all the burdens. Of it. Because, you know, what, like, like I said earlier, you know, I could come off as being this very enlightened being, but at the same time, I have a lot of my own stresses in my life. And sometimes it's good to talk about topics that we know are things that we all toil with. Look, I'm not squatting, you know, 700 pounds anymore, but I went to the gym today and I did legs and, you know, I have a a half a quad on my right leg and my foot is need surgery on it. And I'm a 12, but I still squat. (laughs) I got under the bar and I squatted 135 for reps and I leg pressed, you know, 200 on a, on a, and I, I did my extensions and my inner out of thighs and I still train and because it's important and I still challenge myself and want to see myself make improvements, even if they're minor improvements and, and I don't necessarily want to be 300 pounds anymore. I still challenge myself in the gym and that's what you guys have to do. You don't have to have, want to be Mr. Olympia. You have to challenge yourself. Otherwise you get bored and stagnant and you lose the desire to do what you're doing. And so that's another important thing to consider. Uh, for now that we're out of time and, uh, We're going to wrap this thing up and uh, we'll be back again next Monday for another edition of Iron Therapy. Bye, guys.